please stand for the scripture reading. Acts 13, 4 through 23. From Perga they went to Pisidian Antioch. On the Sabbath, they entered the synagogue and sat down. After the reading from the law and the prophets, the leaders of the synagogue sent word to them saying, brothers, if you have a word of exhortation for the people, please speak. Standing up, Paul motioned with his hand and said, fellow Israelites and you Gentiles who worship God, listen to me. The God of the people of Israel chose our ancestors he made the people prosper during their stay in Egypt. With mighty power, he led them out of that country. For about 40 years, he endured their conduct in the wilderness. And he overthrew seven nations in Canaan, giving their land to his people as their inheritance. All this took about 450 years. After this, God gave them judges until the time of Samuel the prophet. Then the people asked for a king, and he gave them Saul, son of Kish, of the tribe of Benjamin, who ruled 40 years. After removing Saul, he made David their king. God testified concerning him, I have found David, son of Jesse, a man after my own heart. He will do everything I want him to do. From this man's descendants, God has brought to Israel the Savior Jesus as he promised. Acts 13, 26 to 39. Fellow children of Abraham and you God-fearing Gentiles, it is to us that this message of salvation has been sent. The people of Jerusalem and their rulers did not recognize Jesus, yet in condemning him, they fulfilled the words of the prophets that are read every Sabbath. Though they found no proper ground for a death sentence, they asked Pilate to have him executed. When they had carried out all that was written about him, they took him down from the cross and laid him in a tomb. But God raised him from the dead, and for many days he was seen by those who had traveled with him from Galilee to Jerusalem. They are now his witnesses to our people. We tell you the good news. What God promised our ancestors, he has fulfilled for us, their children, by raising up Jesus. As it is written in the second Psalm, you are my son, today I have become your father. God raised him from the dead so that he will never be subject to decay. As God has said, I will give you the holy and sure blessings promised to David. So it is also stated elsewhere, you will not let your holy one see decay. Now when David had served God's purpose in his own generation, he fell asleep. He was buried and his ancestors and his body decayed. But the one who God raised from the dead did not see decay. Therefore, my friends, I want you to know that through Jesus, the forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you. Through him, everyone who believes is set free from every sin, a justification you were not able to obtain under the law of Moses. The word of the Lord for the people of the Lord. Praise be to God. Thank you. You may be seated. I can see you're already doing that, so thank you. Yeah, that was a rather long scripture reading, but you'll see why we did that this morning in just a moment. We're going to be looking for the next three or four weeks at least on the idea of telling your Jesus story. Because we just celebrated Easter, Pentecost is coming June the 5th in the church calendar year. Between the time of Jesus' resurrection and Pentecost, he made several appearances. And people had their Jesus stories to tell. Mary at the tomb, the two disciples on the road to Emmaus. Uh, they ran, to, uh, and Thomas was absent, and, and the others told him their Jesus story. He appeared. They told their Jesus stories, and that was what was so exciting. So we're going to talk about how do we tell our Jesus story, right? or your Jesus story. So let's pray. Father, thank you for the time we get to share together every time we get together. Uh, the way you've called us to worship you through song, through prayer, 
And then through the proclamation of your word. I pray, Father, you will touch every heart here with the words you have just for them. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, because you are our strength and our redeemer. In Jesus' name, amen. There was a young boy, aged 11, by the name of George, who was getting ready for a birthday party. He had some learning disabilities, and he was not a popular child among his peers. And so as it came time for his 12th birthday, the few children that had shown up for his party gathered around as he began to open this one brightly decorated box that had been given to him for this occasion. And so he was so excited. His eyes were glistening. He, he ripped off the paper, he opened the box, and his fingers reached in to grasp nothing but air. Surprise! The children all shouted in laughter. They had played a cruel trick on George. Unfortunately, that is the view of reality. That is the view of life that permeates throughout our world in this day and age. That there's really nothing in the box. It's all empty. I don't have to tell you. Well, it helps if I turn it on. I don't have to tell you. They're used to. There used to be a time when the belief in God and the story of Jesus reigned paramount in the culture of the Western world. I mean, it was supreme. Most everybody believed it, but that's not true any longer. For over 200 years, we've been sold a different story of the modern Western world. And this script has been written by philosophers and scientists and evolutionary thinkers. It's the gospel of scientific materialism. If it's not something that you can taste, touch, or feel, if it's not something that can be examined through the power of reason, if it's not something that can be proven through scientific protocol, then it's not worth believing according to the world we live in. And this heavily influences the way that you and I live our lives. It influences our personal story. See, we've been told that the chief actor in this story you and I are living is human reason. That nothing can be treated as true that can't be proved by reason or by scientific method. And therefore, we human beings have become the central characters in the story that we live. And so, since we live in this culture, we have all inherited the critical method legacy, which has left us doubting everything until nothing seems certain. I mean, think about that in terms of, I'm not, I'm not going to get into political things, but we've been told, follow the science, follow the science. Do you remember how, you remember how many times the science, has, the science has changed over the course? So we feel, everything feels uncertain. And, and, and in this reality, we are the storytellers of our story. We are the main characters. And the only problem with that is that when you and I are born... We've entered in the middle of the story. And we don't know how it begins. And we don't know how it ends. And if there's no universal storyteller, then the universe can have no story line. No ultimate purpose. Neither you nor I, nor all of us together, can so shape this world that it makes any sense. It's like Humpty Dumpty and all the king's horses and all the king's men can't put Humpty together again. Is, is there no story? Is there no overall plot that makes sense of anything? If so, then we are cast back on ourselves. And this is what we do, each of us, scrambling to write our own 
little story as best we can. Now this beginning might sound a little philosophical. Let me put it down on a level we all can understand because this is so evident in our society over the past several years. Uh, Just look at magazines on our newsstands and in grocery lines. 50 years ago, top-selling magazines, Life and Time, those were the bestsellers. Now, that's pretty big concepts. Life, that's a pretty big concept. Time, that's a big concept. And then, a few years later, came out People. Now, now People is a pretty large category, but not nearly as large as Life or Time. And then, a few years later, Us. That's pretty restrictive, you know, just us. Before long, we might have a magazine called Me. I mean. (laughs) But do you know know why that happened? If there's no bigger story, if there's no bigger narrative than our own short individual lifespan, then that little dash between the dates of our birth and our death on our tombstone, then we are all grasping at straws to find some sort of meaning, some sort of purpose in a world devoid of both meaning and purpose. And that's the way people all around us are living their lives. And they might not even be aware of that. Lives of quiet desperation. And and we, even as believers, we can get drawn into that same way of living our own lives. We can get confused about the real story. The story of the gospel. A bigger, better story. The passage that Carrie read to us from Acts chapter 13 is the first recorded sermon we have in the book of Acts preached by the Apostle Paul. And did you notice what he did? He tells a story. A big story. He goes through the annals of history of the Jewish people and he tells, and of all creation really, and he tells a better story than those people he preached to that they had ever heard before. In fact, it's the best story. Is there a bigger, better story that will show us who we are and make us different people than what we are? And Paul says... Yes, there is. And he says, let me tell you that story. And from Luke's account of Paul's preaching, we learn again this bigger, better story is told in the Bible. And it's God's story. So notice these three things about this bigger, better story. The first thing is this. The chief actor in this story is God himself. Did you notice how Paul tells the story? Paul puts heavy emphasis on God's activity. He says, God chose our forefathers. God made our people prosper in Egypt. Uh, God led them out. God endured their rebellion for 40 years. He overthrew seven nations. He conquered Canaan. He gave them judges. He installed and removed Saul as king. He raised up King David, a man after his own heart. And from David's descendants, he brought a savior. It's all about God. And I'm pretty sure if I'd been one of those early Israelites, I might have thought I had something to do with the conquering of Canaan. I'm out there swinging my sword. If I were Saul, I would imagine I might want to take some of the credit for the military successes that were waged while I was king. But notice the way that Paul tells the story. There's no doubt who's the main character in the story of Israel. God. We can get the mistaken notion that we are the main character in our story. But that's not the case. And the possibilities and the outcomes of our story will always be extremely limited and ultimately futile as long as we place ourselves in the middle and see ourselves as the central character 
in the story of our lives. Notice something else Paul does. The climax of this story is the story of Jesus. Do you remember in English lit class learning about how to develop a story? You, you, first of all, you have the setting and you introduce the characters. And then there's some kind of a conflict. And then there's a climax, the height of the story. And then there's what they call the denouement, which means everything settles down. You tie up your loose ends. You end the story. Well, see, that's what, that's what I want to tell you about Jesus. Jesus, the, the story of Jesus in the Gospels is not the end of the story because the story is still going on, but it is the climax of the story of God's covenant relationship and His saving activity with His people. In fact, when Paul tells the story of Jesus, he uses the word fulfilled three times. The word fulfilled means to fill something full with meaning. And so the, he uses that word three times. The gospel Paul proclaims, the story he tells is the fulfillment of a plan in a person of the promise of God. Let's look at that real quick. The gospel is the fulfillment of a plan. In verses 26 through 27, which Carrie read, Fellow children of Abraham and you God-fearing Gentiles, it is to us that this message of salvation has been sent. The people of Jerusalem and their rulers did not recognize Jesus, yet in condemning Him, they fulfilled the words of the prophets that are read every Sabbath. Isn't it interesting how this fits in with uh, Catherine's children's moment this morning? See, God's grand plan, the plot of the big story, is to bring blessing to the whole world through one family, one nation, and its king. And the deep irony is that the religious leaders in Jerusalem unwittingly fulfilled this previously stated plan of God by condemning Jesus. Think about that. It's God's plan. It happens because Jesus is condemned. Mysteriously, God used the most evil thing ever perpetrated, the condemnation and death of His only Son at the hands of sinful men to fulfill His own original plan and design. And, and, and some people present it so wrong. It's not as if humans interrupted God's plan A and He had to revert to plan B. What happened to Jesus was always plan A in the heart and the mind of God. It's not an either or. Uh, uh, somehow in the mystery of God's design, it's both and cruel humans took Jesus and they nailed him to a cross. And at the same time, Jesus was the Lamb of God who was slain before the foundation of the world. That's what the Bible teaches. It was all a part of God's plan. And when Jesus said, it is finished, he had fulfilled what God had intended. God's plan. The second time Paul uses the word fulfilled is... This plan was fulfilled in a person. In verse 29, he said this, When they had fulfilled all that was written about him, they took him down from the cross and laid him in a tomb. Fulfilling all that was written about him is how Paul describes it. You know, that's exactly the same way that Luke described the story of Jesus' resurrection appearance to those two people on the road to Emmaus. Remember? Jesus took them. They didn't even realize it was Him. And He goes through all the Scriptures, the Psalms, the Torah, the Prophets, every, every Scripture to show that it's all about Him. It all points to Him. Jesus is the pivotal character in this saving story. And this whole story turns on the dramatic events of His death on the cross and His resurrection from the dead, viewed by Paul as a mighty creative act of God. This is what he said in verses 30 and 31. But God raised God. Once again, God. But God raised him from the dead. And for many days he was seen by those who had traveled with him from Galilee to Jerusalem. They are now his witnesses to our people. And finally, in the fulfillment, the fulfillment of a promise in verses 32 and 33, we tell you the good news. What God promised our ancestors he has fulfilled 
for us, their children, by raising up Jesus. Do you see that? What God promised, He has fulfilled. God had a plan through a person, His Son, Jesus. And through His death and resurrection, this plan of God that He promised to Abraham and Isaac, Jacob, David, all the way through the history of His people, that plan, that promise has been fulfilled. And the story has reached a climax. And Paul then presses home his case, issuing a challenge to the people he's preaching to and an invitation. He urges that through this person, Jesus Christ, you and I can be written into the story of salvation. The challenge is the offer to them of being part of a bigger, better story. So, how does that happen? We are each invited to join the cast of the story. <laughs> Verses 38, 39. Therefore, my friends, Paul says, I want you to know that through Jesus, the forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you. Through him, everyone who believes is set free from every sin. A justification you were not able to obtain under the law of Moses. They were challenged. And we are challenged to join God's big story. To be drawn into what he's been doing and he will continue to do throughout all of human history on this earth. And so the question we need to be offering people, the question we need to ask ourselves is why stay in a small, minuscule story? The metaphor might be, why stay in amateur dramatics in a small community theater when we're called to come to Broadway? <laughs> it's much bigger than that, though. And here's the thing. We are being offered freedom from the failures and delusions of our own self-made story. See, the, the gospel story is a call to radical repentance and radical faith. Forgiveness of sins is now offered through Jesus Christ who bore those sins on the cross. God's forgiveness invites you to trade in the old, tattered, repetitive script of your own life for the brand new true story whose personal chapters God will help you write. As the whole story in the Bible confirms but contrary to the false rumors that people spread about God, God is not interested so much in controlling people as in giving them freedom. Real freedom. That's what Paul said here. Freedom to become everything that he created you and me to be. So the invitation is to join the cast of those who live out this story. And just as Paul ushered that invitation in his first sermon in the book of Acts, that's the kind of invitation we should be offering to others. An invitation to come and join the cast of thousands, more than thousands, millions who are repentantly, enthusiastically, often imperfectly, but always hopefully learning their parts in this greatest story ever told. Notice, in this gospel, Paul says, everyone who believes, everyone who believes, joins the cast, the community of faith. Whatever your upbringing, whatever your background, faith makes this story your story. And that is the greatest story ever told. That is the bigger, better story that God invites you to join. And after you've entered into that story, He wants to use you, if you've already entered the story. He wants to use you, He wants to use me to invite others 
into this bigger, better story. And so we're going to talk about how to do that in the weeks between now and Pentecost. But I want to end with this last illustration. I don't know how many of you had geometry or how many of you loved geometry. Uh, But you'll remember a point or a dot and a line in geometry. Now, a line is a straight one-dimensional figure having no thickness and extending infinitely in both directions. So we imagine if we draw a line, this is just a line segment. This line in geometry goes on forever and ever both directions. So Randy Alcorn came up with this idea one time. Our life on this earth is a dot. That's all it is. I mean, you think about the vastness of the universe. You think about how small our planet is in that universe. And then we're an individual person on that planet. If we're, if we're dot, that's, that's our life. Right there. But you know, a dot can also be a part of a line. And so here's the question we have to ask ourselves. God is infinite. God never, always has been, always will be. The question we ask ourselves, are you living for the dot? Or are you living for the line? That's what gives your story, your life, meaning, purpose, and significance. Let's pray. Father, thank you that not only through the gift of your Son, Jesus, do we have forgiveness of sins and we have a hope to be with you in heaven someday, which we will be if we put our faith and trust but in, in him and the, the work you've done through him. But Father, you're interested also that you want to give our life meaning and purpose right now. And you have given our life meaning and purpose. If we truly understand, help us to quit living for the dot of our own little life that's right here that really is insignificant if it's not connected to you. The significance comes because we're a part of a bigger, better story. Your story. I pray that we see that. In Jesus' name, amen.